Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today, for many of you, will need no introduction. His name is Ken Wilbur. With 22 books on spirituality and science and translations in more than 25 countries, Ken Wilbur is now the most translated writer on consciousness studies in the United States. He is seen as an important representative of transpersonal psychology, which emerged in the 1960s from humanistic psychology and which concerns itself explicitly with spirituality. For the fundamental and pioneering nature of his insights, he has been called the Einstein of consciousness research. His debut, The Spectrum of Consciousness, from 1977, established his reputation as an original thinker who seeks to integrate Western and Eastern psychology. No Boundary, from 1979, which summarizes this work, is one of his most popular books. His core works, The Atman Project and Up from Eden, cover the territories of developmental psychology and cultural history, respectively. In his recent work, especially the voluminous sex, ecology, spirituality, he has criticized not only Western culture, but also countercultural movements such as the New Age. In his opinion, none of these approach the depth and detailed nature of the perennial philosophy, the conception of reality that lies at the heart of all major religions, and which forms the background of all his writings. This fundamental work has been summarized, too, in A Brief History of Everything from 1996. In his most recent, uh, in his most personal work up until now, Grace and Grit, Wilbur gives a moving account of his relationship with his second wife, Treya, who died of cancer in 1989. In a more recent book, One Taste, A Personal Journey of the Year 1997, he offers insights in his way of life and his spiritual experiences. He currently lives in Denver, Colorado. In 2000, he founded the Integral Institute, which is a think tank for studying issues of science and society in an integral way. So hello, Ken, thanks so much for joining me today. Well, hello, Jacob. Thanks for having me. So it's such an honor and a pleasure to talk to you today. I, I encountered your work many years ago when I was a student of Western philosophy, and I had, um, at that time, I had uh, had encountered Eastern philosophy somewhat while I was, you know, had started my yoga practice, and I was right. sort of moving away from Western philosophy towards Eastern philosophy, so I found your reflections on Western philosophy particularly illuminating and inspiring, and, and I feel like you were one of the first people I kind of found who really did who was able to reflect on patterns in Western philosophy and critique them from a more um, expansive, we might say, Eastern philosophical perspective. So I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking a bit about that today. But before we get into all that, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your own personal story and what led you to this work. Well, I, um, my upbringing and all of my early education was essentially in science. Mm. And I'd gone to Duke University in the medical program. And as soon as I got there, I just knew that I had no interest anymore in, in, in sort of just studying a kind of uh, scientific worldview. Yeah. What had become really obvious is that it just didn't answer – you know, all of those stupid, idiotic questions that <laughs> people tend to have, you know, yeah. he just was silent. And so, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What does it all mean? I mean, and uh, then I started to get notions of and, and I'm a, a sort of classic boomer uh, yeah. child of the 60s. And it was here in the 60s that, that we really first started to get a lot of influx of Eastern traditions. Yeah. And so in particular, things like Zen Buddhism and um, the writings of D.T. Suzuki. And all of a sudden we had this thing called Satori mm. and just the whole notion that there were different states of consciousness and those disclosed a different type of world fundamentally. And that these also uh, opened on to territories that were referred to as your own true self, your original face, your real self, um, supreme identity, the great mm -hmm. liberation, and so on. This is not your father's philosophy. I mean, right. this is really outrageous. And so I, I uh, basically um, just started a very intense, very sort of obsessive study of Eastern and, and Western traditions. And by Western, it was just sort of everything. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it really just was a, a crash course in philosophy, psychology, psychotherapy, um, and how all of that fit with the various Eastern traditions. And then, uh, of course, that uh, 
opened me up to the idea that there were some traditions in the West that were contemplative traditions. And so we could start to find some, some general similarities <coughs> um, between those and things like Zen or, or Vedanta or Taoism and so on. Um, and, and that sort of came around to um, what was generally at that time referred to as the perennial philosophy. Mm -hmm. And this, this was actually a, a, a sort of school of philosophy, if you will, that um, actually had adherents and advocates and, and um, people that were really well known. Fridges Schoen, for example, um, Ananda Kumar Swami, uh, and, and a, a whole group of people had actually stumbled on a lot of these broad similarities between the paths of liberation, the yogic or spiritual or contemplative or meditative paths that opened one up to uh, what was said to be a deeper reality and a truer self. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I, that's sort of where I started um, in, in a sense. And the, um, the biographical note um, that, that you gave earlier isn't up to date in one sense. Okay. Um, that is um, uh, what I started to see uh, in the perennial philosophy was that it, there, there were things that just really um, were actually left out of the perennial philosophy that needed to be put in. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, what started to become uh, clear to me um, as I'm sort of studying you know, uh, all forms of self, uh, what you could call sort of self-improvement, um, whether it was psychotherapy on the one hand or Zen Buddhism's enlightenment on the other, uh, sort of anything in that broad category. And what I started to notice is that there were really two very different views of development, growth and development, and, and what, in a sense, sort of the highest that a typical human being could aim for in terms of, well, if you have this self-realization, you have this enlightenment, or you're seeing this new reality, or you're seeing this new self, what exactly are you seeing? Hmm. Um, and, and so the more I, I sort of looked at that, it became really clear that even if you agree with the general notion in the perennial philosophy, that human beings have at least two different um, sort of types of reality at two types of knowing, two different types of consciousness, which basically an enlightened awareness and an ignorant or uh, a limited or a dualistic or a suffering uh, type of awareness. And then you could do certain practices and exercises and you would awaken from that restricted, self-contracted, suffering state to your true self, to ultimate reality to spirit itself um, and you would actually become one with that in, in a realization that the Sufis called the supreme identity and that was a pretty standard perennial philosophy notion that all human beings had a small self or an ego and they had a true self that was one with spirit mm. and the whole aim of human beings of course was to realize their true self and, and that meant he would also awaken from Maya or the world of illusion or the world uh, being lost inside the cave of shadows. And you would awaken to the, the world of, of uh, sunlight, of reality, of real truth. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was certainly something that the contemplative traditions in the West tended to agree with, with that kind of general assessment. And certainly most of the Eastern traditions tended to uh, agree with that. But in the West, we sort of uh, ended up kind of losing track of that version of, of self-realization or, or, or self-improvement in, in an ultimate sense. Yeah, because I, I want to actually back up to something you said just based on that, because, you know, when you were remarking sort of um, in a joking way, you know, these stupid idiotic questions of who am I, why am I here? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not without insight that you you refer to them in that way, because, you know, having again, having studied Western <laughs> philosophy, if you if you bring these up in the context of a Western academic philosophy department, generally people are rolling their eyes. You know, these are right. these are considered almost immature questions. It's like, 
like, you know, oh, these are sort of like ch ch childlike questions. We're doing much more serious things here in, in right. Western philosophy, blah, blah, blah. So can you explain like how we got there and what that is a symptom of, that attitude, that sort of like arrogant attitude about the perennial philosophy? Well, sure. I, and and there, there are a couple of tracks that, that we tended to lose lose track of that. And one of them was the, just sort of the major religious current in, in the West. And it certainly um, was, was the general monotheistic current uh, that went from Judaism to Christianity to Islam. Mm -hmm. um, and what we find, if we just even look at something like Christianity, is that uh, it started out um, very much aware of these sort of altered states of consciousness and of the necessity for waking up or enlightenment or what the New Testament called uh, in Greek, which is what it was originally written in, uh, referred to it as metamorphosis. Mm. And St. Paul described it as, quote, let this consciousness be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, that we all may be one. Yeah. And that's a pretty good uh, version of uh, ultimate unity consciousness or Satori, um, uh, enlightenment, awakening. And for the first couple of centuries after um, Christ's death, that was what Christianity essentially represented. If you wanted to be a Christian, you would actually look for a teacher and you would judge the teacher based on what was called sanctus or sanctified or what we would say uh, awakened or enlightened. Mm. And you would find a teacher who was awakened to that Christ consciousness, that unity consciousness, and you'd study with them for a year or two or three uh, until you had that same awakening yourself. Um, and then that was sort of um, what Aristotle called the summum bonum. That was the greatest good of a human being was to was to realize that that groundless ground of, of all being. Uh, and that was the realization that uh, Christ had uh, apparently had. And that was the realization that you could have, too. Mm -hmm. And that was essentially at that point, that was roughly in line with what would be called the perennial philosophy. It, it, it sort of fit into most of those essentials. And the problem was, as uh, the West continued to um, develop in, in its own way, um, is that the Catholic Church became sort of more and more powerful. And according to the church, um, it was sort of, quote, nobody comes to salvation except by way of Mother Church. Hmm. And that started to become a little bit problematic because these mystical experiences, these states of unity and, and satori and enlightenment and, and unity consciousness, have a nasty habit of going straight from God to you. Hmm. Uh, they bypass the church. It's kind of yeah. nasty of them, but but they do. And the church became increasingly suspicious of, of mystical forms of spirituality. And so it it started to promote, um, since if you sort of look at the at let's say Gene Gepser's broad stages of human growth and development where he saw them moving from an archaic stage to a magic stage, to a mythic stage, to a rational stage, to a pluralistic, to an integral stage, which is where we are today with uh, higher stages yet to come. Um, but this was generally during the, the, the great sort of mythic uh, era. And what the church started to define as, as uh, authentic spirituality um, it turned out to be a, a mythic interpretation of this um, Christian unity state. And by mythic, we don't mean any uh, really deep metaphors with great transcendental meaning. Uh, most myths, when, when they first emerge in, in human awareness, um, James Fowler actually calls that stage the mythic literal. Mm. Because what it means is, is we take the myths to be literally true. Right. So there, there's nothing profound about it. Moses part of the Red Sea just meant literally Moses stood next to the Red Sea and, and he parted the waters. And the Israelites walked, walked across on, on dry land. That's what it meant when it was originally written. It didn't mean that you were going to find your true self or anything 
like that. Um, so God really did rain locusts down on the Egyptians, and Lot's wife really was turned into a pillar of salt, and uh, Lao Tzu really was 900 years old when he was born. <laughs> and it's kind of on and on and on, and that's just sort of the mythic literal stage of development. Uh, human, human beings go through that stage in their own development today. It's usually from around ages six, seven, eight or so. Uh, up until adolescent, when uh, more rational uh, modes tend to uh, emerge. Um, but, but the church was promoting this sort of mythic literal um, version. And so what you have with things like the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and stuff like that, which mm. started to become the major form of spiritual awareness around the third century, uh, you were a Christian if you subscribed, if you agreed, mm with those mythic literal beliefs. Not if you had had an awakening, right. but if you simply believed in the myths. Uh, so if you really believed that Jesus was born of a biological virgin and was killed, resurrected on the third day, if you believed all of that, you could you were a, a Christian. So, so previously what you would have to do if you wanted to be a, a, an authentic Christian was you had to find a teacher who was sanctus, who was enlightened or awakened. You had to study with them for one or two or three years until you yourself had uh, an awakening to to this uh, ultimate ground uh, of being and this truer reality and truer self. And, and, and then you could uh, legitimately call yourself a, a Christian. And that would take several years. Now what had happened with, with this sort of switch over to this mythic literal view is that you could go in in the morning to a, a Christian teacher, a minister, or a bishop, or some anybody who who, who was a recognized um, authority, and say, "I want to be a Christian." And they say, "Fine." You read the Apostles' Creed. And they say, uh, "If you agree with that, sign on the bottom line." Uh, <laughs> and you sign on the bottom line. They're like, okay, "That's it. You're you know you're it." Um, and if there was ritual, it was okay. Well, we're going to dunk you in water. Um, and you're going to be baptized, and, and, and that's sort of the only ritual you need. Uh, and, and we're going to give you some um, wine and, and bread, and, uh, and that'll, that'll do it. And, and so with those couple of rituals, uh, within a, a day or two, you could be an authentic Christian, which means you would be just as idiotically stupid as you were before you were a Christian. Yeah. And in some ways stupider, because now you're really believing – some what are, are really just myths. I mean, you know, Zeus isn't really there. Apollo isn't really there. Aphrodite isn't really there. And neither is Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Not in that sense. So uh, that became a real problem. And um, as the West tended to um, unfold, we really started to get fewer and fewer uh, schools or disciplines or, or, or even organizations that really became aware of this fundamental waking up capacity that human beings have available to them. And uh, as we continue to look at sort of the relative side of unfolding, um, Gene Gepser stages those archaic to magic to mythic to rational to pluralistic to integral. Those refer to the relative self. The, the true self doesn't go through those stages. Um, there are types of meditative stages that you um, can go through to help you realize this true self. And, and that's a path that we call waking up. Mm. But this other path is what the relative self, in a sense, the ego. What we found is that the ego itself grows and develops. It goes through various stages of, of development and, and unfolding. And those stages, uh, we've got an enormous amount of research on the stages that human beings in today's world uh, go through. And because the almost all Western psychologists are not tracking states of waking up, they basically aren't really aware that human beings have that capacity of a satori or a moksha or a metamorphosis or an enlightenment or an awakening. And so it, they just it, – it's not part of any major psychological model uh, in the Western world. And so – but what they did do was very, very carefully look at – the stages of development that human beings go through um, 
when they're not uh, doing uh, awakening or enlightenment or waking up or, or any of those. And these models, there are there are several dozen of them. Uh, some of them have been have been tested in over forty different cultures, including Amazon rainforest tribes and Australian Aborigines and Mexican workers, Harvard professors, um, and there are no major exceptions to, to those stages. Um, the the relative self does indeed grow, develop, and, and, and evolve. And, and those stages, um, although you, there are um, a lot of different models, and there are also a lot of different intelligences that grow and develop. We, they're probably upwards of maybe a dozen. Mm. They're called multiple intelligences. And these are all part of the relative mind and the relative world. So it's not something that you're going to get by studying Zen or studying Vedanta or studying Christian contemplation or anything right. like that. Um, you actually have to do, you actually have to study the relative self and 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 uh, uh, put it through various tests and, and analyze the results and everything in order to to find out uh, what's going on with the relative self. But multiple intelligences mean that in addition to cognitive intelligence, we have an emotional intelligence, a moral intelligence, an aesthetic intelligence, um, an interpersonal intelligence, linguistic intelligence, mathematical intelligence, about a dozen of those. And what's interesting is that although each of those are very different, all of them go through essentially the same levels of development. And so those multiple intelligences are often called lines of development. And all of them go through essentially the same levels of development. And if you look at the uh, different models of, of these developmental schools of psychology, and you look at the different models that uh, exist, they're based on research. Um, what you'll find is, and I actually did this in a book called Integral Psychology. I looked at over 100 developmental models uh, worldwide, uh, East and West, pre-modern, modern, postmodern. Post um, and what was so interesting is that although there were some, some major differences in, in all of them, there are also a, a, a large number of, of, of real similarities. And one of the similarities was indeed that although all of these these lines are different, in all of, of these models, in all 100 of these models, you could see it's the same around six to eight major levels of development that all of these models have found. And they are indeed uh, similar. One version of, of this six to eight levels of relative self-development or relative cognitive development or relative moral development and so on. In other words, this doesn't involve waking up or enlightenment or anything like that. That's a different path. That's called waking up. This is a path we call growing up because this has yeah. to do with relative developmental uh, growth and, and development. And one version of those, uh, indeed, were, were the names that Gene Gebser uh, gave. And those were, uh, again, uh, archaic to magic to mythic to rational to pluralistic uh, to integral. And so though what was so interesting about those stages is that the more we started studying them, the more we found that if you, if you sort of looked at, at um, the way human beings as a whole have maintained that you can indeed improve yourself or that you can discover uh, a higher, truer, better self has really come down to these two major paths. There's a path of waking up mm -hmm. and a path of growing up. And what's so interesting is that is that none of those schools, none of the paths of waking up and none of the paths of growing up are aware of each other. Mm. In other words, there's not a single system in the world that it explains and advocates both growing up and waking up. It's one or the other. And we simply don't find any examples anywhere of both of these. Now, this becomes a problem because the more we actually, first of all, realize that there were these two very, very different types of development that human beings had available to them. And the more we realize that this had never been realized before in all of our history, 
then the, the more intriguing these these types of of self uh, realization or self improvement in the broadest sense or self awakening um the exactly what they were doing became really really intriguing and why had nobody um, realize that both of these were, were present. Why well, was only one and not the other um, ever, ever advocated by any major school of philosophy or psychology or sociology or religion, East or West? So that it became really uh, an intriguing um, issue. And what we've learned about these two paths, waking up and growing up, really constitute one of the major, major breakthroughs and understanding that human beings have had about reality and their own uh, position in it and their own uh, condition, their own nature, um, their evolution uh, throughout um, 14 billion years uh, of evolutionary unfolding. Um, so this, this has become a really uh, a, a extraordinary um, discovery. And one of the real problems when you don't have any school that's aware of both of them at any time, anywhere, is that the more we realized what was actually happening with growing up and what was ha happening with waking up, is that um, most of the schools of the perennial philosophy distinguish between what they call the two truth, two truths, uh, doctor. There's an ultimate truth and there's a relative truth. Right. And uh, relative truth is something that science would discover, for example, or, or multiple intelligences, those kinds of things having to do with the relative realm, whether um, you're awakened to it or not, doesn't matter, it's still sort of the realm of Maya or um, Maya seen apart from spirit is considered to be the world of illusion or, or deception. Um, and what, um, what the two truths um, would say is that uh, it, so if you if you ask in terms of relative truth what is water made of then relative truth would say well water is made of two hydrogen atoms uh, one oxygen atom something mm -hmm. like that um, and yet if you ask well according to ultimate truth what's water made of well according to ultimate truth water is made of spirit mm -hmm. or or absolute uh, Godhead or mm -hmm. ultimate reality, because that's that's the ground of all being. But you can't simply say that as a logical deduction or right. a rational conclusion. You actually have to experience it. It's mm -hmm. a direct, immediate awareness. And if you don't experience that, then anything you say about it, it, it is going to be beside the point. Right. Um, and this is sort of uh, was made really clear with. Nagarjuna's whole uh, Shunyata uh, philosophy, which gave rise to Mahayana Buddhism, and focus on the whole notion of emptiness. Um, that essentially, any concept you use makes sense only in terms of its opposite. Right. But ultimate reality doesn't have an opposite. Therefore, you can't think your way into ultimate reality. Um, it's more like judo or even baking. It's an actual practice. It's something you do that changes your awareness to a different state of consciousness and in that changed state that's when you will see this ultimate ground of being or that's when you, you'll become aware of it um, and so we have these two truths we, we have this sort of ultimate truth and we, and we have relative truth and what it turns out is that waking up involves the types of practices or exercises or stages that you'll go through in order to realize an ultimate truth. And growing up involves the relative stages you go through in, in relative reality. And so, so, so both of those are true in the sense that both of those truths exist. Um, but what we, the more we started looking at these models of growing up and what, what was really involved in growing up, and the more we looked at the waking up and what was involved in that, and given that waking up it was always claimed to be to some sort of ultimate reality, some sort of ultimate ground of all being, some sort of ultimate truth. And then relative reality didn't say, oh, we're only dealing with relative reality. They just weren't aware of ultimate reality. And that's sort of what relative stuff does. It's, right. it's called ignorance, and you, you just aren't aware of it. Yeah. Uh, so, but it turns out, and, and even the perennial philosophy 
would end up agreeing with this. It turns out, though, that that these two truths are non-dual. In other words, ultimate emptiness and relative manifestation or form are not two. It's the whole doctrine of non-duality. So the Heart Sutra would say that which is emptiness is not other than form. That which is form is not other than emptiness. And so how does that actually work with these paths of waking up and these paths of growing up? And what it turns out is that these waking up experiences, precisely because they're non-conceptual, it means they're non-philosophical, they're non-logical, they're not anti-logical. They sort of transcend and include logic, but they can't be captured by logic. And so the way, if you have a waking up experience, and you and and then you tend to explain it to yourself, or you think about it, or you talk about it, or 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 you're in in a uh, practice that's helping you with that realization. You're going to enter the whole relative realm of of thought and concepts and and typical language and typical relative uh, reality. And and those two, they're not separate dimensions. They're, they're intimately interwoven. And what, what that means, the way it turns out, is that you can have one of these waking up experiences. You can have a profound satori or moksha, uh, samadhi realization. And it can be completely thought-free, formless experience of unmanifest infinite reality. But as soon as you come out of that state, and as soon as you start thinking about it at all, as soon as you start explaining it to yourself at all, as soon as you start thinking about it at all, you've entered the realm of, of relative reality. And therefore, you've entered the realm of growing up. And so what that means is that you're generally at one of these major levels of growing up, your magic or mythic or rational or pluralistic and so on. And so if you have a waking up experience, and there are a couple of different types, but they all are, are, are trans-rational in that sense. They, they can't be grasped in mere conceptual or linguistic forms. But you'll interpret that waking up experience according to the stage of growing up that you're at. And we've got enormous amount of data on, on, that, on that point um, today. Um, but it, it's astonishing because what it means is that if you if you look at the stages of growing up, and um, again, most of the models give around six to eight stages. Some of them give fewer stages. Um, some will just give four or so major stages of, of growing up that, that people go through. Um, and it doesn't mean that, you know, down the road in some future period that there can't be higher stages of growing up. Um, studies that have looked at humanity on the whole, going back around 300,000 years, have suggested that the stages of growing up that we see in a human being in today's world, and that, uh, for example, go through archaic to magic to mythic to rational to pluralistic to integral, around 300,000, 400,000 years ago, Humanity at large was just at an archaic stage hmm. that wasn't at magic or mythic or rational or, or, or pluralistic or, or any of those types of, of developments. And so if we look at what those developments actually mean, we can look at a model that has just, let's say, four major levels. And several of them have just four major levels. One of uh, the best known people that have presented um, a four stage model um, is well known because she's uh, uh, an iconic feminist and uh, generally feminism doesn't really like things like levels or ranking right. stuff um, but but her name is Carol Gilligan she did a book called In a, In a Different Voice and uh, she indeed suggested that men and women tend to think differently in that book she, she made two points. One is that men and women do tend to think differently. Men tend to think hierarchically and women tend to think non-hierarchically or relationally. And feminists love this because uh, since only men think hierarchically and since all hierarchies are thought to be 
dominator hierarchies are the source of oppression, then the patriarchy and men were the source of all evil uh, right. in society. Um, but uh, so they love that part of Gillikin, but they completely ignored her second major point for which she actually gave evidence. And that was both men and women grow and develop through four major hierarchical levels of growth. And that was her term. So as she explained them, the, the first stage, she's called selfish um, because the woman cares only for herself. And we also call that egocentric. And then her second stage, she called care because the woman extends care from just herself to an entire group. It could be the family or the clan or the tribe or a nation or even one's religion. Um, and so that was care because it's extended to a group, but not to all groups. So it's just, you know, my race or my sex or my religion or my country or my tribe. It's an ethnocentric type of uh, stage of, right. of development. Uh, so it's bigger than egocentric, but it's still ethnocentric. And in her next stage, she called not care, but universal care. And it's at this stage that the woman cares for all groups, all human beings, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. And so we also call that world-centric. Mm -hmm. uh, and then her fourth stage, she called integrated, because the woman tends to integrate both masculine and, and feminine forms of thinking. So so even right there, if you just take those simple stages from selfish or egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric to integral, what evidence has demonstrated, and since we knew to start looking for this, is that you can have a waking up experience at any one of those stages. And you'll interpret that experience according to that stage. So, for example, <laughs> you can have somebody at, at an egocentric or selfish stage uh, of development, and they can have this experience of being one with absolutely everything in love and bliss. But they'll think that they and they alone can have that kind of experience. And so some of them will even think, for example, that they are Jesus Christ. Yeah. And of course, our, our you know um, our institutions are, are full of people that that, that have those uh, um, beliefs. Uh, Ram Dass actually had a brother who was institutionalized because of exactly that problem. And Ram Dass said, huh. "When, I didn't when know you that. met him, yeah, well, uh, he, but what was interesting about it is Ram Dass said you could tell when you met him that he had an authentic unity consciousness. He had a real satori." Um, but he couldn't get that other people, including Ram Dass, could also have that experience. Mm. So that's a waking up unity state interpreted from an egocentric stage of growing up. Mm. And so if you keep growing, however, and you, and you move up to the ethnocentric stage, and then you have this experience, uh, let's say you're still Christian, and you have this experience of, of Christ consciousness being one with the entire world in love and bliss. Now you'll think that you can have that experience, and that's a genuine experience of Christ, Christ consciousness, but only if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Because if you don't, I don't care what you think you're experiencing, it's not God, mm. and it's not Christ. I mean, you're clearly confused. So you can have – that's a waking up experience interpreted to an ethnocentric level of growing up. And, of course, most of the fundamental uh, fundamentalist religions in the world today come from this ethnocentric stage of development. And most of them believe that. Most of them uh, do not – I mean a, a, you know, a, a certified uh, Muslim um, – does not believe that a Buddhist uh, can uh, get into heaven. Right. It's just not going not to work. Um, and so that's a real uh, a real problem. And it's also because at, at this stage of human evolution overall, even though people were having waking up experiences, they were still at an ethnocentric general stage of development. And so things like, even though the world's great religions um, were being laid down around the world 
it was still at this ethnocentric mythic literal stage of development and so uh, every great world religion tended to be born in this ethnocentric period none of them objected for example to slavery Mm-hmm. So uh, St. Paul says to slaves, uh, obey your master and worship Jesus Christ. Uh, Christian and Buddhist monasteries had slaves. Uh, one out of three citizens in Athens, home of democracy, were slaves. And nobody cared. We didn't actually, humanity didn't universally object to slavery until the next major stage of growing up, which was the world centric stage Mm -hmm. and that happened only about 200 years ago right and started in the west and in about a 100 year period every major rational industrial country on the face of the planet outlawed slavery for the first time in our entire history so even though we had those waking up experiences going on even though you could be a, 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 a an enlightened christian you had no trouble with slavery, nor did you have any trouble with sexism, racism, misogyny, or uh, untouchables, or anything else like that, because that's the way the ethnocentric stage thinks. And so even though you're having a waking up experience, even though you're enlightened, you're ethnocentrically uh, interpreting it. Mm-hmm. And so if you then go on to a world-centric stage of development, then all of a sudden Jesus Christ is no longer the sole son of God. Christ becomes simply one authentic teacher among many other authentic teachers, including Buddha and Shankara and Lao Tzu and, 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 uh, um, and so on. But that's a stage that doesn't come from the waking up side of the street. That comes from the growing up side of the street. And only if you reach this third major stage, this world-centric stage, this universal care state, only at that point do you really think that all sentient beings are, are capable of, of, of experiencing this, this saving grace, this ultimate reality, this ground of all being. And then, of course, you can still look at the fourth stage as, as being uh, integral or integrated, which means it sort of understands all, all of the previous stages. And um, when we look at these higher stages uh, in more detail, as part of the six to eight uh, major stages of development, the higher two stages are generally some version of what's called integrated or integral stages. And what sets them apart is all of the previous six stages think that their values are, are the only real values in, in the entire world. And everybody else is wrong, infantile, goofy, or just you know idiotic. <laughs> But as soon as you get to, to the seventh stage out of eight stages, which is the first integral stage, all of a sudden it thinks that each of the previous stages is important and significant. It has something to tell us. Um, if for no other reason, then all of them are stages in, in our overall growth and development. And, and you can't delete stages of growth, just like you can't get rid of you know, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. Uh, right. and, 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 you know, just go from sec to eighth. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what we're seeing is we've got this growing up path. It, it is in the relative world of form. But remember, emptiness is not other than form and form is not other than emptiness. And, and the way that they're not totally different is that no matter what degree of waking up you have, you will interpret it according to the stage of growing up that you're at. And yeah. I this, think, sorry, this sorry, just stunning. sorry. No, go, I, so go ahead. Well, all I would say just to uh, sort of finish this this broad uh, thought um, out. One of the reasons that no spiritual system anywhere is aware of these stages of growing up is that, unlike a waking up experience, all waking up experiences are. are referred to as what's called first person. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they're a direct, immediate, personal uh, experience, and you're completely fully aware of them when you have that experience. So if you have an experience of being one with the entire world in love and bliss, you'll know it. It, There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's just, it's there, and that's what what you're aware of, that's what you're feeling. Um, These stages of growing up are much more like grammar. 
So everybody in a particular culture will grow up speaking that culture's language quite correctly, basically. Then they'll put subject and verb together correctly. They'll use adjectives and adverbs correctly and so on. In other words, they're following a large number of grammar rules. But if you ask any of them, uh, write down all these rules that you're following. Most of them have no idea that they're following rules, let alone what they actually are. And that's what these stages of growing up are like that. They're third person. They are interpretive grids. They're not something that you can see by introspecting. And that's why these stages of growing up, the the states of waking up, human beings were aware of, uh, possibly as as far back as as some of the earliest shamans, maybe 50,000 years ago. And, uh, but the stages of growing up weren't discovered until about a hundred years ago. Mm. And so if, if you take somebody like, let's say James Fowler, who um, did an extraordinary amount of research that he summarized by just calling it stages of faith. And what he meant by that was, these are not stages of waking up. He didn't study people who had had enlightenment experiences or awakening experiences. He just studied the average person, whether they had waking up experiences or not, but just the average person, how they think uh, about spirituality or what we would just sort of call a spiritual intelligence as opposed to direct spiritual experience. If you have a direct spiritual experience, that's a waking up experience. If you're just thinking about uh, spirit or or you're sort of trying to figure out what it all means, that's a spiritual intelligence and it's one of our multiple intelligences. So just like cognitive intelligence and emotional intelligence and moral intelligence and linguistic intelligence, spiritual intelligence goes through those six to eight major levels of development, which we summarize as those four levels of, of development in, in, in Gilligan's model. So what James Fowler did, he was the first to actually study stages of spiritual intelligence. So in other words, he's studying the stages of growing up as it goes through uh, the, the spiritual uh, um, uh, thinking. And what he found, no surprise, is that um, every person he studied went through six major stages of spiritual intelligence. In other words, these are the same six stages of growing up that all the other multiple intelligences go through. In other words, spiritual intelligence also goes through an archaic to a magic to a mythic to a rational to a pluralistic to an integral stage of development. And so that becomes let me just put it this way. If, 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 if some of the really great religious founders of the world's religions, if some of the uh, uh, individuals that founded Buddhism, for example, or Vedanta or Sufism, if they knew about these stages of spiritual growing up, every single one of them would have included that. These people were all over things that cause Satori or metamorphosis, or awakening. That's essentially what all the world's religions wanted, is how do we wake up? And if you find out there's not just waking up, you also have to be careful about growing up because you're going to interpret your waking up experience according to the stage you're growing up you're at. And if you're egocentric or ethnocentric growing up, you're not helping. Also, you're not really at an ultimate reality either. You're still at a lesser form of relative uh, interpretation. And if you're interpreting, you can have this experience of oneness with Godhead, but if you're going to interpret that in ethnocentric ways, you're not helping. Mm. Mm. And the really alarming thing is around 60 to 70 percent of the world's population are at ethnocentric or lower stages of development. And that means even if they have a realization, an enlightenment, a satori, they're still going to interpret it in ethnocentric terms unless they do something to help their growing up. So the whole point about a religion of tomorrow is simply asking the question, what would religions do differently if they knew everything that we know about human transformation today? Then how would they change the religion? Mm. Because again, it was about 2,000 years ago that most of them were written down. 
and humanity had no idea that we go through stages of growing up at that time. So not a single world religion anywhere has anything like stages of growing up. But they would have been all over that if, if, if it was there. I mean, especially you look at some someone like um, the Buddhists, for example. I mean, Tibetan Buddhism, um, I mean, I sometimes joke and say that culture technologically just barely got up to yak butter. <laughs> But they spent a thousand years sitting in caves, looking at their minds. Mm. It's stunning. I mean, it's one of the most spiritually sophisticated systems we find anywhere in the world. If they knew about these growing up stages, they would have been all over that. And they would have been giving practices that not just helped you to wake up, but would help you grow up. And that's the real issue that we have to face right now. Because again, if we don't address the growing up side of the street and we simply try to convince people to wake up, what all this research shows is that that's not helping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. <clears throat> wow, that was incredibly fascinating um, history and outline of really the stakes of, of, of oh gosh, Siri's turning on on my phone. <laughs> the, stakes of, the stakes of this development. So thank you so much for outlining it. And, um, and I just want to kind of, you know, highlight how important I think this point is in, because, you know, what, what you're sort of saying is that generally the, the idea has been, at least the way that I've noticed it, is that people sort of assume that if you have a waking up experience, that you're going to grow up automatically, you know, yeah. that, that that's yeah. actually a, a process of growing up. And so, and, and, and it, you see it across the board, like people who are having like really rich meditation practices, but then they leave their meditation and they're assholes, right. you know, I mean, it's, exactly. you know, it's a, it's a very familiar story. And, and so I really appreciate you like making this distinction. And I think it's such an important important point that that your you know your dualistic understanding is going to shape is going is going to have its own is going to write its own story about that non-dual experience and right and um and so you know you have we we went on this call to talk about the religion of tomorrow and and that's sort of where you ended up at the end of 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 your explanation so i just want to um to emphasize to the to the listeners that we're talking about Ken's recent book, um, which is a massive tome, I'm holding it right now, uh, of, of some uh, almost 800 pages called The Religion of Tomorrow, A Vision for the Future of the Great Traditions. And, um, and of course, Ken goes into uh, incredible detail regarding all of the things that he's just talked about. But Ken, is there anything else in terms of that book? Um, you know, I know you you have been talking about essentially the same topic, but you, 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 you discuss it in the book in relation to the Buddhist tradition, and you speak about the fourth turning of the Dharma. So do you want to kind of approach it from that angle and give us a kind of um, how that fourth turning of the Dharma plays into what sure. you're talking about? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things that started happening, um, essentially in the 60s, um, when I uh, first started writing, and when we had the initial uh, influx of, of the Eastern traditions, and that sort of really made us aware that there was something else going on with religion that was, um, it just wasn't in our, you know, you didn't get in Sunday school. I mean, there, I mean, there was some really important shit going on. And it wasn't just, you know, mythic, literal nonsense, um, uh, you know, about God raining locusts down on Egyptians and stuff. I mean, so so it, it really blew us away. And particularly um, when D.T. Suzuki published um, a three-volume set called Essays in Zen Buddhism, um, Heidegger read that and said, if I understand Suzuki correctly, this is what I've been trying to say in all my writings. Amazing. Uh, the historian Lynn White said the translation of Suzuki's writings into English will historically prove as important as the translation of the, the Latin Bible in, wow. into English. Mean, it's that kind. It just stunned us. It's like we had no idea idea that that was available and then we really started kind of digging into our own culture and you know looking back at some of the contemplative schools and people like saint john of the cross and saint Teresa and meister eckhart and so on and it's just a whole other world opened up and when that started happening i was essentially writing on that kind of thing and um this was a you know a little over 50 years ago and i, I wrote my first book when i was 23 um 
but it really caught on and it, it sort of created a, a sort of international uh, group of people that were aware uh, of some of these issues. And so, of course, they wanted to uh, not only wake up, but they wanted to grow up. I mean, if these things were there and, and, and you know, both of them were, were so incredibly important, of course, you wanted to, to include those. And then we would also just sort of look at, you know, what else have we learned about human beings uh, in the past 2000 years that if we knew 2000 years ago, it would definitely be put into a religion because it was so important. Yeah. And certainly the growing up stages, uh, it turned out to be one. Uh, another one turned out to be another discovery that was only a couple hundred years old and essentially uh, due uh, to the modern West. And, and that was the whole a psychodynamic unconscious, mm. uh, particularly so say with names like Freud and his inner circle of Alfred Adler and Carl Jung and Otto Rank uh, and, 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 and that crowd. Um, but that was said to be, uh, at least you know the way the West viewed it, one of the three major discoveries about human beings, uh, along with Darwin and, and Kepler. Um, so, so we just sort of started calling that, which had to do, do with shadow work. We started calling that cleaning up. And it was also pretty clear that most of the world's great religions didn't know very much about shadow material right uh, they knew a lot about you know they would call things like defiled emotions or or that and they had ways that you would uh, substitute healthy emotions for defiled emotions they didn't really have an understanding about how you could take defiled emotions and repress those suckers <laughs> and when you did it converted into a neurotic or even psychotic symptom and, and then you're just in a whole nightmare mayor of, yeah. of hurt and pain and, and, and turmoil. And so, of course, that would be important. And, and the more we learned about, you know, the shadow material and psychological and conscious, the more we started to realize that that's very hard to separate from the whole religious dimension in general. Um, it, it, because not only do many people go into religion because they actually have shadow issues they're trying to work out, right? Um, but but also a lot of shadow issues themselves tend to show up as as sort of um, religious uh, dogmatic truths, and you really kind of go, okay, wait a minute, that's let's, let's back up a little bit there. Um, so so we just started adding a few things um, like that. Oh, and with the understanding that uh, any religion of tomorrow, if it's going to actually, I mean, if, uh, this is set in a context of, uh, I would preface it by saying, for example, 11% um, of Northern European individuals, 11% consider themselves religious. Hmm. Um, and that, that's going down. Yeah. So, um, what do we learn from that? Well, <laughs> religion's going to die if if something doesn't change. Yeah. And so we're saying, well, one of the things that has to change is we got to really get waking up back in the picture. I mean, what's the whole point of any sort of religious life? It's not just to be, you know, not to drink and not to sex and you know, not to be mean. Uh, it's to wake up. It's to discover uh, ultimate reality or Godhead or spirit. Um, and so you get waking up back in the picture, understand the importance of growing up because you're going to interpret that waking up depending on where you are and growing up. Uh, and then also uh, something to do with, you know, cleaning up. Um, mm -hmm. And if there were schools of sort of quote self-improvement, that actually gave you access to all three of those, that could start to become interesting. Uh, first of all, it, it wouldn't be in conflict uh, with science. So you wouldn't have all these so-called new atheists like Richard Dawkins, Ugh, and, so and annoying. Harris, Hitchens, <laughs> you know, running around and, and making fun of what? Mythic, literal religion. Uh, how hard is it to really make fun of that? Exactly, exactly. They don't even, think about waking up and interestingly the only one of that group that does is sam harris because he's a practicing buddhist and he never attacks buddhism of course so <laughs> he, he doesn't really know exactly what's what you know what's going on 
<laughs> but we wouldn't have that kind of conflict because that religious belief only happens at the magic and mythic stages of growing up. Those yeah. drop out at rational and pluralistic and integral stages of growing up. So we wouldn't even have it in, 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 in the growing up stages, not all of them, certainly not in the higher stages. So there wouldn't be – the way most religion is uh, in today's Western world, for educated people, it's, uh, it's something to, to ridicule. Yeah. It's, you make fun of it. It's a laughing stock. It, nobody takes it seriously. Um, and uh, it's, it's essentially taken to be an extremely detrimental force uh, uh, on the planet. And there's a lot of reasons for understanding that. Most mythic, literal religions are ethnocentric. So they're not helping with human unity or solidarity or love. They're helping with human division and separation and and uh, even hatred. Uh, no surprise that over 90 percent of the really horrible terrorist attacks in the last 50 years have been performed by religious fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. It's not helping. So uh, we really are going to have to just completely sort of rethink this this whole spiritual dimension. Yeah. And what we've learned is sort of humanity on the whole has learned that what you want to do to have an authentic life is at the very least you want to wake up and you want to grow up and you want to clean up. Yeah. And if you do those, then that honestly, that's our best guess to get you as close to ultimate reality as can happen. Mm. Let me ask you something. So do you think that it's important to reappropriate and rebrand the word religion rather than just throw it out and, and start over with something like, you know, you hear this all the time, like spirituality. I'm spiritual, but not religious. And so people yeah. sort of have, like, as you're saying, the word religion is sort of, you know, rife with connotations of of uh, detrimental things that have been associated with the the mythic um, uh, stage of development like you're talking about. So what is, you know, what is, is there an importance to revivifying this word in relation to where we are developmentally, or it, could we just as well use a different word? Well, I, you can go with your website and, and call it uh, chitology. <laughs> um, but uh, seriously, uh, yeah. I, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, six, six and one half dozen of the other, um, people say I'm, I'm spiritual and not religious, uh, for a reason. Yeah. And, and the reason is that most of the things that call that are actually identified as religions, uh, come almost entirely from the mythic literal yeah. level of growing up. And it should, I mean, uh, any six year old can reproduce most of those ideas, mm -hmm. Um, you have people that are, you know, 40 years old teaching them. Um, that's something's really off about that. Not too many people want to actually identify with something like that. So we might just have to um, come up with a whole new uh, God talk language. Right. Um, it, it's kind of funny if you look at humanity on on the whole. Because um, if you look at the stages of, of growing up, what most of the models include um, is that even though I said they had sort of six to eight major uh, stages or levels of development and, and the highest um, level or two are generally given names like integrated or integral or something like that. But, but there are also most uh, of the models have a few even higher stages that, that – a, a, a very rare number of people reach, um, but that will become apparently more common uh, down the road. Uh, uh, just as at one time, almost all of humanity was at a magic stage, and then uh, thousands of years later, most of them were at a mythic stage, and then with the Western Enlightenment, uh, the rational stage came to the foreground, and then in the 1960s with postmodernism, the whole pluralistic relativistic stage came to the foreground. Um, and uh, so wh what these higher stages all look like, with almost no exceptions, are they, they're transpersonal, they're transrational, they're spiritual in a sense, um, but they're not, they're not you know, anything like a, a mythic literal. Uh, those are pre-rational. These are transrational. 
in other words, it, 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 the, the mythic pre-rational stage simply can't think rationally. So it, it's pre-rational. Mm -hmm. um, but trans-rational stages have, have already passed through rationality. And, and now they're moving in, into even higher stages. So, so they're fully aware of rationality. They transcend and include rationality. Mm. But, but what this actually means is that there's a type of waking up that goes with the very highest stages of growing up. Now, if, if, so if you look at humanity's evolution on the whole, you, you find a really strange sort of movement, and that is originally, so, so for at least 500,000 years, um, God essentially was everywhere. There were no atheistic tribes. There, there weren't even agnostic tribes. Everybody believed in some sort of a spiritual something or other. Um, and whether it was shamans, uh, you know, contacting it in, in their uh, um, shamanistic journeys or vision quests, uh, there simply wasn't uh, a group of indigenous people that didn't believe in spirit. Um, so God was everywhere. And, and this stayed the case with humanity really right until the Western Enlightenment, with the emergence of rationality. And with that, all of a sudden, the whole religious dimension starts to look like nothing but myths. Mm. And so you either did one of two things, you either ditched religion entirely and became you know, an existentialist or a rationalist or something like that, um, or you tried to demythologize your religion. Um, and there, there's actually an apocryphal um, image of Thomas Jefferson sitting on the steps of the White House with a Bible and a pair of scissors mm. in hand. And he's furiously cutting out all the uh, magic and mythic uh, uh, miraculous shit out of the Bible. And <laughs> just keeping it, it, it's <laughs> rational and moral uh, uh, elements. And this was actually published. It was called the Thomas Jefferson Bible. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah. So, so, so that's uh, – but there, God was dead mm -hmm. at that point. And, and Nietzsche announced yeah. it and uh, every uh, – educated and intelligent person on the planet believed it and so all of a sudden it we went from god is everywhere to god is nowhere and that was a hugely wrenching period mm -hmm. for humanity i mean you know books are written on it great novels i'm losing my faith i'm losing my religion i god doesn't make sense anymore and so we went from god is everywhere to god is nowhere and now it looks like if we keep growing god's going to be everywhere again mm -hmm. Because yeah. it's, it's an actual stage of development. All of these waking up states of consciousness, those don't come with the territory. You actually have to do work to have a waking up experience. You have to do years of meditation or contemplation or yoga. Um, so th those are, are not something that you, know, you simply keep living and you'll kind of automatically go through them. Most of the stages of growing up are like that. You, you don't have to try to become uh, rational after you're mythic. Just keep growing and you'll sort of move into that stage. Um, but that means if you just keep growing a couple hundred years from now, then when you're 25 or 30 or 35, you'll be moving into, into transpersonal, spiritual, stages of growing up mm. so all of a sudden god is going to be back again and what we're going to have is a real problem because everybody is still born at square one so even though all these stages of growing up evolved over over uh, several hundred thousand years um everybody starts at square one everybody who's born today starts at square one so you're born at archaic stage and from around years one to three you'll move through magic stages and then mythic and then rational and pluralistic and mm -hmm. and and integral so um that's going to actually um become part it appears of of our uh, of our future and so that's going to um, uh, be really, really interesting. And exactly how we we fit those two gods together, because one is pre-rational and essentially childish, and one is trans-rational or essentially highly mature. 
and and developed and and people are going to know when they say god they don't mean the god of the old testament yeah yeah um and so they're going to have to work all of that out and uh i you know i can see it going either way um i think a whole lot of other factors are going to enter into that decision uh and there's no way to really tell what those are right now yeah uh, but you can see people saying i'm spiritual and not religious that's a little indication of what's coming yeah yeah i want to ask you a question actually about about god as we're talking about it because well first of all thank you for chitology <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I am definitely going to use that, and I'll, I'll credit you at some point down the line. Um, uh, you heard it here first, everybody. So, um, and, and so I appreciate your point about you know religion. You know, you can call it whatever you want; like it doesn't really matter. It's it's happening. Um, but with but I sort of want to ask a similar question about God. And the reason I'm ins yeah. inspired to do this is because I ha was having this conversation with with someone who was born as an atheist her her whole life, and we had this kind of interesting conversation where I was kind of trying to sell the idea that you know, me coming from a religious background where God had been, you know, the, the idea of God was monopolized by this, you know, personified, you know, form in the sky, blah, blah, blah. And it took me a long yeah. time to get over that as we're talking about. And now I do have this more sort of like expansive, integrated God is everywhere. It's not a person in the sky with thunderbolts right. type of, you know, and that, and I can, and I'm on board with that. And so I have this sort of mission to reappropriate and rebrand the word God. Right. And, but, but she was like, you know, no, this is so, it's so saturated with with um, this kind of uh, whatever she's associated with it being uh, from an atheistic kind of uh, uh, tradition that she does it you know she's not behind the idea of of seeing it as God so is there something to be uh, is is there something in you know the word God that there isn't in the word religion that we might that might um, uh, that might indicate that we would want to kind of re identify this word based on its historical, you know, um, uh, its historical understanding? Yeah. Well, um, again, I think there are, um, you know, fairly reasonable arguments on both sides uh, of that street. Yeah. But certainly one, one of the problems and, and an argument sort of against um, reappropriating God is simply that the historical baggage of God is is overwhelming um, and, and it's meant mostly in like 95% of the cases it's been a pre-rational magic or mythic entity mm -hmm. and it, it's exactly not the type of trans-rational trans-personal uh, realization right. that you're getting from something like an enlightenment or awakening or metamorphosis or, or, or so on. Yeah. And so if we're actually coming to a, a point in humanity's history where either because we increasingly become aware of waking up possibilities and, and actually take up the practices of waking up um, because we see the value of that or the really higher stages of growing up do sort of involve a kind of waking up. But if either of those two versions of, of waking up come back so that humans in large numbers are talking about some sort of spiritual awareness. Uh, and what we really want to know is um, let's say, for example, that artificial intelligence is getting to the point where they're starting to download uh, types of consciousness into computers. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, it's kind of a, um, an implicit faith of Silicon Valley that yeah. that's, that's the way we're going. <laughs> um, and so I always keep saying, oh, God, uh, I know. Just be careful what stage of development you're at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't, don't, don't download you know, <laughs> a, a, an ethnocentric or egocentric <laughs> asshole stage and be stuck at that for the next 4,000 uh, millennia. Um, so at the same time, they might you know, start uh, downloading uh, types of God consciousness. And the whole point there would be, well, if we really had, let's just say, for sake of argument that we call the pre-rational magic and mythic forms uh, of God, uh, that we actually call those God, and then the transrational forms we call spirit. So um, we would actually um, have some very well understood ways to distinguish yeah. between pre-rational 
and transactional. Mm. Uh, and and since the pre-rational forms are are also all pre-world centric. In other words, they're, they're ethnocentric or egocentric. In other words, they're trouble. Uh, what we'd really want to make sure is that we didn't allow any of those to slip in to states that were idealized uh, in the future. And so one of the things we want to do is make sure that you really were transrational and not pre-rational. And therefore, you really were in touch with spirit and not God. Yeah. And if that sort of became an understanding that we had and the actual terminology started to reflect genuine ways that we distinguish mm. between those states uh, of awareness and given how important they are in, in so many ways, then you could see, um, you know, I'm saying something like I'm spiritual but not religious would actually be a way would mean that somebody is, you know, I'm, I'm developing into transpersonal stages of, of growing up. Uh, and, and so that could that could end up being important, and it could end up being um, an important way um, that that people distinguished um, between them. Yeah. And so you can always sort of make that uh, argument. And on the other hand, you can also um, argue simply that um, even though um, many or even most of the people that that have used the word God uh, in the past. Um, were at, at egocentric or, or ethnocentric stages of development. In other words, they were racist or sexist or misogynist or something nasty. Mm-hmm. Uh, that nonetheless, uh, uh, there were many important ones that weren't. And certainly a whole lot of the founders of the great traditions uh, weren't. Um, and, and so you're, you're really just sort of trying to establish a historical thread uh, in, in terms of linguistic use. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's certainly possible. Um, but what we do want to do um, is recognize that there are some real reasons that people will use a phrase like I'm spiritual but not religious. And those reflect very real differences that are actually out there. Yeah. And it's an important distinction. Yeah. Um, so as, as long as we work that into the final equation – uh, then I think we'll be okay. Okay, yeah, that's a really good that's a really good way of looking at it. Okay, so now I want to segue into the last um, you know sort of topic that we uh, are going to talk about, which is um, related to this essay that you wrote following um, Trump's election, Trump and a Post Truth World, which was that subsequently then published as a book with Shambhala um, relatively recently. And um, and I read through that. And it's it's really interesting. And and so I I guess it's a sort of a good note to end on because I, for those listening, it might sort of sound like. Um, you know, it seems like it's all good news. We're evolving. Things are moving in this kind of increasingly expansive direction. But we, you know, we have to move through these stages, blah, blah, blah. But for a lot of people listening, they might be thinking, well, you know, we seem to be going backwards. All of a sudden we're at, you know, the headway we've made is, has backtracked and on all of this. So, you know, based on sort of what we're talking about, um, and in, just in the interest of time, because I do have to leave in 15 minutes to, to, to teach private, unfortunately. <laughs> um, you know, what are the, based on our discussion, like what are the kind of key points to reflect upon when we're considering, you know, what's happening with 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 Trump and this this seeming increase of ethnocentric kind of um, right. hatred? Right. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me. No problem. One of the um, one of the things that book tries to do essentially is it, it focuses on a specific um, developmental dimension, which namely the path of growing up, and then it does uh, go ahead and give um, around six or so of the major stages of yeah. growing up, um, because we have something that most people understand as as the culture wars. Yeah. Um, and what most people don't know about the culture wars is that although they, they sort of understand the kind of three major value systems that are at war with each other, namely there's a traditional uh, value system often ensconced in uh, a fundamentalist religion. Uh, for example, um, and it believes in family values and it uh, believes in God and country and so on. It's often very patriarchal, 
um, that is to say, sexist. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's often uh, a bit racist and so on. Um, but that's one set, and that does tend to be an ethnocentric set. And then another set is we have is kind of the rational, scientific, modern mm -hmm. set of values. And people kind of know what that is. And, and before the 1960s, those two values were kind of the main values that were at each other's throats. And uh, Republicans tended to be sort of traditional, and the Democrats tended to be more modern and, and sort of rational. Yeah. Um, and then in the 1960s, we actually added a third set of values. And as it turns out, these three values, the third set, by the way, uh, which came into being essentially in the 1960s, was uh, called the postmodern set. Um, it's also known as multicultural. Um, it values diversity and inclusion and all of those catchwords that everybody knows. And those three value sets, the traditional, the rational, and, and the postmodern, or the traditional pre-modern, rational, modern, and pluralistic postmodern, those happen to be three stages in growing up. Mm. And they are essentially what many developmentalists do is just looking at the stages of growing up, they notice that there's kind of a, a major shift in, in the very highest stages and the lower stages. And we mentioned this before, and that's at the higher stages, they're often called integral or integrated have uh, uh, an intuitive understanding of the importance of all the previous stages. Yeah. And, and so that's why they're, they're called integral or integrated or systemic. They're inclusive. And the previous stages, they don't have that. They think that their view and only their view is, is, is the one correct uh, way um, um, to proceed. Yeah. So, so we have um, these sort of four value structures. We have the three main ones that are more or less understood by the culture at large, the traditional, pre-modern, the modern rational, and the, and the, and the pluralistic uh, or multicultural postmodern. Uh, and then unknown to most of the people that know about those is that there's a yet higher stage, uh, essentially an integral stage, that, that kind of uh, is aware of all of them and um, realizes that you have to take all of them into account. Yeah. Um, simply because everybody's born at square one and everybody will be moving through those stages. Yeah. And then we have a large number, again, the 60% the, um, uh, or so of the population worldwide is at traditional ethnocentric, mythic or lower stages of development. And so that's a real problem. And the um, and then we have the, the next stage, which is the rational, modern, sort of scientific business profit uh, kind of values. And, and then we have the more recent pluralistic, postmodern, uh, multicultural, sensitive, inclusive. Um, the, the, um, what happens is that if you actually look at all of those stages and then as well, um, the highest stage that is emerging at this point, which is the, uh, an integral stage, um, it, it, can, it actually sheds an enormous amount of light on um, various cultural trends that are happening in this country and around the world. And it certainly helps to explain things like uh, Donald Trump. Yeah. And um, one of the um, uh, uh, sort of background ingredients that, that's important to understand, and the reason that I, that I uh, called the book itself uh, Trump and um, a post-truth world, is that um, this, uh, this sort of leading edge of cultural evolution for the last uh, 40 or 50 years has been that postmodern, pluralistic uh, sensitivity, diversity, inclusiveness um, uh, stage. Um, it came into existence uh, essentially, like I said, in the 1960s. Um, and it just dominated humanities almost from the start. And it had a very different set of values than anything we had seen previously. Mm. And in particular, um, it's, it started to understand evolution. Uh, it became aware of all of the different cultures that human beings have lived in and how almost none of those cultures could agree 
if you actually put them all together, they're all sort of disagreeing with each other on what's ultimately true and really true. And, and so all of a sudden, truth just started to have no real meaning to mm. these postmodern theorists. And so what we were getting from this, and this included all of them, this included Derrida and Foucault and Jacques Lacan and Bourdieu, and I mean, it's just on and on. Uh, every single one of them, you could summarize what they were all saying uh, just by saying uh, there is no truth. Mm -hmm. uh, truth is a, is a social construction. It, it's a fad. Um, it has no more actual reality or importance than, let's say, hem links mm -hmm. uh, or taste in food or, you know. Um, and, and so this, this whole notion – now, what they were actually doing is – they were on to uh, an important truth, which is if you just sort of say, okay, evolu everything is evolves. Well, if you really mean everything evolves, then that means the notion of evolution that also evolved, that's going to change too. So also really everything is, is just kind of thrown up in the air if you're going to say that. And if you are going to say that, then how do you really decide things like what's a morally good thing to do, uh, what's an aesthetically good thing, what, what's a, an actual truth versus a fall, false uh, kind of thing to say. And uh, unfortunately, most of the postmodernists screwed that up bad. And it just, it just turned in to uh, a very negative deconstruction. And what they, what they used that sort of viewpoint to do wasn't to go back and find some common patterns in our evolutionary unfolding, mm -hmm. which, by the way, a small group of people did, and they called it genealogy. And that's sort of a, the group that I would have much more in common with, with that group. But most, the vast majority of them simply used that notion to say, therefore, there is no truth. It, it's just, it, it's all made up. Yeah. It's just nothing but a social construction, and all of that changes. And most of those things, because they're not grounded in truth, most of them are grounded in sexism or racism or imperialism or colonialism. Or, I mean, on and on and on. You can't say anything good uh, about um, today's world because it's, it's all the result, not of truth, uh, but of uh, unfolding nastiness and mean-spirited impulses. And that's what sort of postmodernism left us with. And since there was no truth, it really uh, evolved into uh, narcissism and nihilism. And uh, my general point is that you can't, evolution can't have a leading edge that is driven by narcissism and nihilism. Yeah. It has no idea what even forward means. Yeah. And, and because of that, um, it, it, it falls apart. And so what, what we see with Trump is uh, he was uh, – well, what the leading edge of evolution started sending out in a sense was a series of SOS uh, vibrations. It's like, OK, something's not working here. This is falling apart bad. Um, all around the world, we're finding people that are regressing into earlier and earlier and lower and lower forms of culture. Um, we're not driving towards a, a, an increase in unity and, and solidarity and, and love. We're devolving into tribal sets and geopolitical factions, and most of the world is warlords fighting other. I mean, it's just, it's just falling apart. Um, and it's falling apart in large measure because nihilism and narcissism will not take a leading edge for if you're actually going to try and lead using nihilism and narcissism nihilism won't let you see anything and narcissism will only let you see yourself yeah and that's no way to lead that, that's not a <laughs> that's not a leading edge that's a broken edge and so what we start to get are these strange signals that are sort of anti-broken green. In other words, the, the very leading edge of evolution itself is saying, get me out of this broken green. Mm -hmm. we, we have to route around it. And that's what you find in a sense if you just sort of look at, at evolutionary unfolding. When it hits obstacles, it routes around them. That's sort of what it does. That's why things keep getting 
more whole, more complex, and more conscious. I mean, we've gone from quarks and atoms to the sonnets of Shakespeare. I mean, it, it's it's pretty amazing, actually. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, you have somebody like Donald Trump, who, not for any reason that he himself understands, but he's he's insulting every uh, sort of dogma of, of the traditional postmodern leading edge. He, he's anti-political correctness. He comes on as misogynistic. He comes on as, as sort of uh, hidden racist, hidden sexist. Hidden, I mean, all of the things that would alarm Green. Yes. Um, Donald Trump sort of embodied. And so much so that because he's in a sense riding that current of anti-greenness that, that, that was coming off, off evolution's leading edge itself, um, he actually rode those currents. He himself, nor none of his followers, and certainly none of Hillary's followers, thought that he had a chance yeah. of winning. And that's because nobody was tracking this hidden uh, morphic field which was just essentially anti-political correctness, anti-broken green, anti-postmodern, uh, uh, which was everything Trump was. Um, if you look at all the stages of development that Trump activated, so he activated some that were egocentric and some that were ethnocentric, and so, but all of them were anti-postmodern. Um, he wanted to increase the military. He wanted to close the, the boundaries. He wanted to stop. Uh, world trade, who I was just uh, 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 an ethnocentric smorgasbord. Yeah. And, uh, and that's my point is just if you look at the overall evolutionary unfolding that we see going on, you can start to see where the leading edge itself was contributing to this. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of uh, kind of almost the only way that really makes a lot of sense in the how the hell somebody like Donald Trump uh, is the president of something like the United States. Um, and, and, and so that was and that was it. I, I, just, I just sort of jotted that down uh, in, in about 100 pages and put it online and the damn thing went viral. <laughs> uh, so, so Shambhala got a hold of it and said, OK, we sent it to some readers and sort of got the highest feedback of anything we've ever done. So we're going to try and bring it out. And uh, the quickest we've ever brought a book out from beginning to end was eight months. But we want to do this one in three months. Cool. And so I went, OK. Uh, so usually I get a book back from them. And I have three or four weeks to turn it around. This time I had two days uh, to turn it around. And they brought it out in three months. Uh, and it was kind of funny because the religion of tomorrow had just been released. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I've got both of these out now. And, and obviously some quite different crowds are, are mm-hmm. interested uh, uh, in each. Although most of the people that, that are interested in the religion of tomorrow – like yourself, are also interested in, in the Trump book because they're just – they're big-minded people. They're, they're interested in all these things. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean they're, <laughs> they're both fascinating and I mean they both complement each other in, a, in, 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 you know, in beautiful ways. And, and, I, what, and I appreciate the book, the, the Trump in a Post-Truth World, because I think that um, outlining this you know, historical tra- trajectory of, of, of the kind of leading edge of – and, and seeing it also, being able to capture it, I think, in an evolutionary sort of unfolding vocabulary right. is something that people don't really do because oftentimes, oh, evolution is that thing that, you know, that biology is doing. But here in the kind of cultural social world, we're not, you know, we're not subject to those laws. And, and so I appreciate the kind of way in which you outline how the leading edge of evolution, as you put it, sort of needed to break apart in order to reorganize itself. And that's sort right. of what we're at. It had to be it had to be slammed apart with a sledgehammer, which is essentially right. what Trump is in order right. in order for us to figure out, you know, where things were starting to go off off the rails. So. Right. So, yeah. So this has been a fascinating conversation and we're we're just at the end of our time. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity, Ken, while we're still on the line, if you want to share if there's anything coming up that, you know, in any I don't know if you're presenting or doing workshops or any kind of retreat or something like that that you might want to share with the listeners. Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm always uh, working on on the next book. Yeah. Um, and in this case, it uh, it happens to be um, a book on. Um, 
integral uh, tantra essentially means uh, sexual paths to, spir- to spirituality. Um, and I, uh, given the sort of years of research that I put into East-West stuff and human growth and development and all of that, um, certain interesting, somewhat novel uh, notions about Tantra have, have become increasingly um, apparent to me. I think they yeah. make a lot of sense. And to the extent I explain them to other people, they, they're, they're very uh, impressed or they enjoy it a lot. Uh, so I'm in the process of, of working on, on that right now. We'll be bringing out um, a course, uh, an, uh, a web course at uh, integrallife.com. Uh, and then I'll be turning it into a book. So that, oh, excellent. that's, yeah. So about when will that be published? Do you have a, you have a publish date for that yet? Uh, 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 no, but um, the first um, web course that will include um, a lot of details on it uh, is is has already been uh, videotaped and will be out at uh, Integral Life uh, in early fall. All right, excellent. So I'll do, we'll, we'll point people there and I'll put that in the show notes, integrallife.com. And is there, are there yeah. any other websites that people can find you at, Ken? Uh, at uh, Integral Institute and at Ken Wilbur. Um, but, uh, both of those tend to be, um, a little bit supported right now. We're redoing both of those websites. Uh, so the, the main one, uh, remains at integral life. All right. Excellent. Well, this has been such a fascinating conversation. Ken, thank you so much for sharing your time. You bet. 